When I started college in 2008, one of the fastest ways to make new friends was to ask them what their Hogwarts house was. <laughs> a decade before, Harry Potter had swept me and so many other millennials up in his magical world, and although we were technically now young adults, that story connected us despite differences in race, gender, and background. As humans, we've been telling stories to unify us, and documenting those stories since we've lived in caves. We've developed quite a few more methods since our days of cave drawings, but still, I have always been fascinated by monuments, memorials, and markers. Built public memory is intriguing because while it references the past like history, it is often formed in a very different way. As my mentor, Dr. Lydia Brandt, has written, while humans research and write history, choosing one source over another to make specific arguments, they construct memory much more collectively, organically, and emotionally. We learn a lot more about the people who erect markers, memorials, and monuments than we do about the historical periods those objects actually discuss. In 1951, the state legislature formed the Georgia Historical Commission. One of the three founding purposes of the commission was to put up markers to sites of the Civil War. By the time the commission disbanded in 1973, they had erected at least 1,752 markers throughout the state. They completed almost all of that work between 1951 and 1963. Over that 12-year time frame, they averaged placing more than 100 markers per year. That's a lot of information to fact check. Do you think it's possible that every single story on those markers is correct? <laughs> Even if every statement is correct, do you think the stories we were telling on those markers in the 1950s and 1960s represent all Georgians today? In 1954, this marker was erected at the old Sorrel Weed House. The facts on this marker are true. And do they really capture the full story? It reads, a fine example of the Greek Revival style, this building shows the distinguished trend of Savannah architecture during the first half of the 19th century. So we learn about the house some. The Mediterranean villa influence reflects the French background of the original owner, Francis Sorrel, who, as a child, was saved by a faithful slave in the massacre of the white colonists in Saint-Domingue. We certainly don't use this terminology today, saying slave instead of enslaved person, rob Sorrel's rescuer of their humanity. We also don't learn anything else about this person beyond the fact they rescued Francis Sorrel. We don't get any more information about the uprising, which, by the way, that uprising was the Haitian Revolution, which is the revolution that led to the first free black republic and was led by self-liberated people. Here resided as a youth G. Moxley Sorrel, who achieved fame as one of Lee's lieutenants. Shortly after war broke out in 1861, Sorrel, a young bank clerk in Savannah, proceeded to Virginia where he served with conspicuous valor and zeal through major battles and campaigns in that theater from the first Manassas to Petersburg and was thrice wounded. Here the phrase, conspicuous valor and zeal stands out. Is that what we're supposed to think about the single bloodiest conflict in American history? that it was valorous to fight to maintain the enslavement of an entire group of people based on their skin color. The facts on this marker aren't necessarily wrong, and how this story is presented and who we talk about erase so many people from the history of our community. Civil War memory and Confederate monuments have been discussed in wider circles in recent years. So why was it important to tell a Civil War story on the Sorrel Weed House marker in 1954? Vice President of the Confederacy Alexander Stevens proclaimed in March 1861, right here in Savannah, the Confederacy's foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man. 
that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. A study by the University of Virginia found a strong correlation between the sites of racially motivated lynchings and the locations of Confederate monuments. I think that correlation shows that the same attitudes that led to the erection of Confederate monuments led to racially motivated lynchings. The Oglethorpe Monument here in Savannah was unveiled in 1910 during the golden age of Confederate monuments. Viewing the monument today, most people only see a celebration of Georgia's founding father. At the speech at the unveiling, J. Randolph Anderson said, The Battle of Bloody Marsh that day decided that the Anglo-Saxon and not the Castilian was to be the master of the New World. Anglo-Saxon was shorthand in the early 20th century for white, and people from Southern Europe, such as Castilians or the Spanish, were not considered white. In 1910, this monument told a story celebrating white rule in North America. It was unveiled during the height of Jim Crow segregation, and this monument is just as much a product of a desire for a white supremacist racial order as any Confederate monument. So what do we do with markers and monuments like these two? They're everywhere. Well, by simply maintaining them, we are maintaining that they represent us, our values, what our community means to us. They show us who is a part of our community and who is excluded. There is currently no process to revise the state-sanctioned markers unless they are found to be factually incorrect. All over Savannah, there are markers that are not factually incorrect, and they still erase the presence of so many of us from our past. These markers could be revised to present a more connected and inclusive interpretation of our history. What if we advocated for a local ordinance? Savannah has a historic site and monument commission that reviews all new markers and monuments that go up in Savannah's historic districts. What if we were to automatically require the regular review of older objects so they're kept in step with current understandings of history? For the Oglethorpe Monument, a more powerful statement than simple removal is counter-memorialization. Georgia wasn't built physically by Oglethorpe. He wasn't here building the buildings of Savannah. Enslaved people were. He's not the one that planted rice or cotton. He definitely wasn't the first person in this geographic area, and he didn't even speak the local language. Mary Musgrove translated for him. What would it be like to have a memorial to the people who were enslaved and indentured and labored to actually create the state of Georgia, standing here, right next to and just as proudly as the Oglethorpe Monument. Can you imagine what it would be like to have a memorial to the indigenous people who were here first, standing boldly in Chippewa Square? Objects we pass often without paying attention, they matter. Built public memory is intentional, and even if we pass by every day and don't always pay attention, people that visit here do. Children pay attention to what objects are telling them about who their community is and if they are included. We need to critically examine the objects we still have up, like the Oglethorpe Monument and old historic markers. And it's equally important that we put up new public memory. Let's leave our mark on the landscape, saying what matters to us, how we are all connected. We need to put up markers and memorials and monuments that counter the stories that have divided us. We need more markers that represent and connect not just our community, but our entire country. It's okay for our understanding of history to change. In history, we discuss the past as best we can with the evidence we have. Sometimes we find a new source and it reveals something we didn't know. It changes our perspective. And because it changes our understanding, we 
change history. We literally write the new narrative as it fits the evidence we have. We don't do this with public memory. And we could. We know that history is not written in stone. So if history is not written in stone, why is public memory?